Are you this, this conference will now be recorded. <laughs> are you in Criminal Justice Club or are you like an officer? Um, well, I'm going to talk about that in the slideshow. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Here's my introduction. Um, welcome everyone. This it's Tuesday. It's coffee with the blue coats. We're hopped up, you know, cheers. Uh, <laughs> and today we have criminal justice club who will be introduced to us by Kirsten Martinez, a criminal justice major, a legend, an icon. Um, <laughs> and yeah, did I miss something? What did I miss? I missed something. Krishan. <laughs> oh, Kirsten and Krishan. They are both members of Criminal Justice Club. Who's oh, that? Wow. Who's that? Introduce. Okay. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> this is wow. because this month we're doing shout out to all the student orgs at Tammy CT. So we're starting with Criminal Justice, and every week we're gonna feature someone else. So take it away, Miss Kirsten. Okay. Yay. Hello. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Cool. So this is a little slideshow that I put together. Um, so the Criminal Justice Club at Texas A&M University, Central Texas. As you can see, we have our little logo down here at the bottom. Um, so our mission, the mission of the Criminal Justice Club is to, write, is to promote education, equality, justice, and the criminal justice perspective on Texas A&M University, Central Texas campus, and within the community. So a little bit about us, the Criminal Justice Club shall provide useful information and experiences regarding the various components of the growing criminal justice field. Students interested in criminal justice can come together to discuss and learn about um, the above mentioned ideas. So the cool thing about a lot of the clubs at Texas A&M University is that you don't necessarily have to be um, in that major or anywhere like near that major in order to join like clubs you wanna know more about. Um, criminal justice is, uh, I feel like it's a pretty broad subject that affects like everybody. Um, so we actually do some events. So this is one of our past events that we did. And we did a family crisis drive and we collected personal hygiene items for families in crisis. Uh, and we placed those boxes around campus to collect those items. Um, and we did that for like families and stuff in need. And it was a nice little community service way to give back. And we also did um, a social issue focus on domestic violence in our community. Uh, we put on an evening. We put on an evening of education and activism in honor of National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. TMUCT Sociology Club and the CJA hosted a film event to raise awareness of and educate the community on domestic abuse as well as help families in crisis. I actually uh, attended this event. This event happened while I was there. And um, a lot of professors actually, like, so if you're in sociology classes and CJ classes, normally you can get like extra credit for attending these events, um, depending on your professor. And it was a really neat experience. I'm trying to think of the name of the movie we saw, but we actually had um, Professor Shane talk to us too, before and after the movie, a little about um, domestic violence and what it means and like where to find help. So this is where I said I was gonna talk about um, like becoming an officer. So the way that the club has like worked the last few years, um, I know especially the last two years, the same people who have like been in the criminal justice club have just kind of like moved up as people graduated. And now all of our, all of our officers, except for our treasurer has left. So there's a president, vice president, secretary position, and uh, I talked to the past president and she said there's actually, we can add more positions um, if we wanted to, to the club, if people wanted to be like more involved in the club than just a member. So I kind of put organizer on there. Um, there's two different kinds of organizers that she said that we could like look at, which are a fundraiser organizer and then um, an event organizer. So, when it comes to elections, I'm pretty sure you just have to be had to have been in a club for at least one semester. I think that's the, the criteria for it. Um, so all these positions are open as of right now. We've talked about the criminal justice club itself because we do have uh, other members, but one of our 
more active members is um, actually in Florida right now because she's in the reserves and she's doing like some training. But whenever she gets back, uh, we've talked about doing um, some sort of like go to me or like WebEx meeting to try to figure out like how to do elections. And that means like people who just want to run for any of these positions, um, the club just be, this votes like yes or no, like to these people. We've already had a lot of internal discussions on who we think um, should fill these positions. But if you want to join the club, if you never, if you haven't like been a part of our club before, um, you can go ahead and do that, and you can be involved in like the voting process to who's going to fill these positions. Um, this is kind of a just what the Criminal Justice Club has done like for me personally and like the perks of being involved in the club. So it establishes connections with your peers and your major and others. Um, it's a really good way to make friends with other people if since this town is a uh, really big military town, there's a lot of people like moving in and moving out. And um, for somebody who moved here recently, it was kind of like hard to make friends. So joining the Criminal Justice Club like allowed me to, to meet more people, to branch out with others and outside of my own major, which I thought was really neat. And by talking to my peers and learning about what they wanted to do with their criminal justice degree, like broaden my horizons of what I could do in the future. Um, it allows for students to give back to the community and learn more about criminal justice related issues. Kind of like I was saying before, like domestic violence or the family crisis. Those are just a few things that we've done. Um, I know Krishan and um, uh, Danielle have gone to other schools, like the ride along things, which he can tell you um, more about whenever we get to him. But it's just, it's just really neat. In our meetings, we normally talk about like fundraisers. Um, we have a lot of guest speakers that come. We actually had Dr. Greenwood's husband come and talk to us, and he's a, he's a defense attorney. Yeah, um, and we were actually going to have an FBI agent. The Criminal Justice Club was partnered with the Psychology Club before COVID happened. We were going to have a, um, oh, what was he? He's from the FBI, he was a behavioral analysis. And he was gonna come in and talk to us but that ended up getting pushed back. But that's just something really neat that uh, that we were gonna pr provide. So we're still hoping to do that if and when the campus decides to get fully functional again. Um, and it provides a safe place to talk about classes to receive advice from older students. So for me, especially um, with upper level like criminal justice courses, you know, it's a, it's a it's a student thing. Like you want to know like what to expect when you go into a class, like kind of what your future assignments are going to look like. And a lot of um, my older, I wouldn't want to say older students, but like the, the students who are like in school or like ahead of me in their courses, they give me a lot of advice of like what classes to take first, what classes like not to take together because of like difficulty level, like when to take these courses. Um, it was just some nice advice outside of an advisor from like an actual student. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my slideshow. I don't know if you guys have any questions for me on any of that, but yeah, that's it. Thanks, Garrett. <laughs> Garrett. <laughs> He's hiding. <laughs> well, when I logged in, there was a presentation. I was like, I don't want to crowd the screen with like a bunch of smaller screens. So I'll just hide. Very considerate. I'm <laughs> just giving so you more. Can I talk too fast? What? No. How do you okay. join the club if if this is a first time student new to Tim CT and they're interested? Is there like an email you guys have or? How do you do it? Yeah, so actually, if you give me one second, I'll pull up our Engage page. Um, like I said, we're kind of in between like our, um, here, I'll share this real quick, share. I have a lot of tabs open. You guys know I always have a lot of tabs open, so don't judge me. Um, <laughs> so, we're kind of in between like elected officials right now. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I really don't know normally. So normally the process goes outside of COVID. Um, you come to like our, the first meeting or whatever that our, our club has and you fill out a general application and we get your like all your information and, and then it's $25 um, to join the club like to be an active mem member and you usually get a t-shirt um, and I think that's really cool just to have a, a t-shirt so we do this is our engage page um, you go to contact uh, you can put your new email address and your subject um, I don't know who Kyrie Booker is maybe I should know but uh, I guess <laughs> But I mean, if anybody has, oh, then we need to change. I need to talk to, to Stephanie. Um, that we, was huh? we if that was... Sorry, Rashawn, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's sincere. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. It is. I just... um, His name's yeah, we need to do all that. Graduated. <laughs> yeah all of them like stephanie sincere um like a lot of our main people graduated and left and like i said we're kind of in between all of that right now um stephanie graduated? Me and Danielle. huh stephanie graduated yeah oh nice of her to tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah she graduated uh last semester so we don't have a president or a vice president or a secretary right now all we have is a uh, our treasurer, and uh, that's it. And he's not really active on our. Um, <laughs> on you our know what? Website. Power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, we're trying to get all this figured out. Like I said, Danielle is really active in the in the club as well, and this this guy named Danny. Um, so we're just trying to get all that figured out. But if they wanted to to go ahead and um, ask more about it, like learn more about it. They can always just contact um, me. I can put my email in the my student email in the chat, or I'm sure they can email Garrett too. Awesome. Because even if they don't fill out an application and stuff like right away, if they contact me, I can at least get like, get them in our um, what is it? What is that? That app that everybody uses for the group me. I can at least put them in our group me so they can figure out like and be a part of the conversation of what's going on and then once school gets back up we can get them their t-shirt and everything else awesome right. anything else for me before kashan takes over you did good, okay. good job thanks uh kashan is going to talk about like what kind of jobs and stuff you can do in like the criminal justice field so i'll go ahead and just let him take it away from here Oh yeah, um, I, I guess I'll start with the ride-alongs. Those those are really cool. Um, I, I've been on a few ride-alongs. Uh, I did 12-hour shifts at night, so it's a uh, it's a different experience. Um, my first ride-along, I went to sleep though. I went to sleep because I, I mean I had never done it, and like it was like like three in the morning, and I just went to sleep. But uh, yeah, I mean they're cool. I I probably have like maybe 144 hours. Uh, I've I've done them. Uh, a lot it's pretty cool um and, and then you get to learn uh, it's really like a networking experience like like for temple i mean like if i wanted to apply at temple like i'm good i got like at least five hours like i'm about to leave. so hope good there and, and it's just it's just a way to connect and then you you really get to see like the other side of everything you know so that, that's pretty cool but there's a lot of jobs you can get uh anything from like law enforcement to like and it doesn't even have to be in like criminal justice. Like it can be like in criminal justice, but like like towards rehabilitation or like um, security or or anything. Like you can you can work your way up in like a police department and uh, do like executive protection, which is something I'm looking at. You could do uh, a postal inspector for the UPS, and, that, and that's pretty cool. It's like 70k a year for that too, so it's pretty I good. <laughs> it's a pretty cool job um you can work for the irs and do like i was looking at one job they had at the irs and it's like you work in like the netherlands so that's that's pretty cool um 
you can work for like the state as tax investigation, arson, um, fire marshals. You can do that. Um, there's all sorts of things, uh, private investigations, like private eyes and stuff, and you can become a security guard, um, all sorts of things. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a, it's not a bad gig, you know, if you have a hard work, you know, it's not just like a job where you can just get because, you know, I mean, you have to have the right heart for it. But I mean, if you do, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a bad place to work. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool things to do, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of good promotional opportunities. I mean, if you work for a police department, I mean, you're looking at, you can do a SRO, uh, dive teams, uh, vice unit, um, like uh, like Miami Vice or something like that, or, you know, stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, like uh, prostitution stings and drug raids and all sorts of things, ATF, FBI, CIA. Um, H-E-B, <laughs> A-B-C, D-E-F. Yeah. Uh, like that, investigative journalism, you can go into that, all sorts of things. So it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty, pretty. Uh, Krishan touched on it a little bit uh, already, but you can actually work with um, like victims too from like like certain crimes. You can like work for nonprofits as like organizers and like that sort of thing. Um, so like whenever we took victimology, whenever I took victimology, um, I was talking to, um, Dr. Bracewell and there's actually like organizations out there who specifically worked with like, um, victims of like sexual assault, like organizations, like nonprofit organizations, like you can go and like work there. Um, so it's like criminal justice related, but it's not like in the heart. So if you feel like maybe police work, security, probation, like all of those things aren't for you. There are other things that you can do outside of that. Um, if you relate closer to like victims, there's organizations or things that you can join um, and do that too, which is which is pretty neat. I, I never thought about that when it before, whenever I joined the, the criminal justice field, I guess. I always associate it with some sort of um, like policing and um, like, regular like law enforcement, but there's so much more to it than just than just that. Mm -hmm. It's funny because that's what my graduate um, degree is in and I'm finding that it's so hand in hand with sociology and psychology and even some of the elements that I've been looking at have to do with some of the counseling things I looked at early in the in my graduate career. So it like it, it has its hands on everything. So you know in that particular um, case I'm getting it and I I'm probably going to stay in higher ed with it, but still have intrinsic knowledge of different departmental things. And and it also gives you a better understanding of what the current climate is and where like systematic racism and, you know, institutional racism and all that comes from. So it's a pretty yeah, good it, it It's really, it's interesting because like it, with criminal justice, it literally affects like every little thing in your life. Like our, our lives are, um, are guided by laws, you know, with everything that we do. As soon as you step out the door and get into your car, like um, there's speeding, jaywalking, your regular like rights of not being able to be like stopped and frisked, like mm -hmm. um, everything that allows you to have like your right to freedom, like privacy, all of that has to do with um, with law and the criminal justice system. So it really does affect, affect you and everybody around you, even if you don't see it. And I always thought that was super neat because I feel like a lot of the times with like different majors, it's a very specific field and you may not interact with that field um, like personally every single day, but with criminal justice, you do. Like every, like I said, as soon as you step out your door, even in your in your home, there's certain things that you, you can and can't do. And you have rights in your home that a lot of people don't know the rights that you do have and that's one thing that i love about being a criminal justice major is that i get to tell other people i'm like yeah like you have a right to not do this and the right to ask these questions and the right to do this and this and this I'm like oh i never knew that and um i think being having not like being mindful of the rights that you have is really important um because whenever those rights are fringed upon then to me, that's very like anti-American. 
So if you're for this country, you should be aware and keep up with um, with the rights that you have. And it's the responsibility of the criminal justice system to make sure your rights aren't infringed upon, which is a big thing. And um, it's another reason why I love it, because I want to make sure that our system is doing what it's supposed to do and not what it necessarily wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sips <and> monster. <laughs> but yeah, when you're not talking to political, the system is doing what it's supposed to do. That's a lovely question. It's just true. It's a big thing, right? You know, the, the main thing of the criminal justice system, like specifically, we're it's supposed to like protect us. We're supposed to be America. We're supposed to have like um, the freedom, like certain freedoms. Um, but of course we have, this is a, a criminal theory. We have social contract theory, which which basically means that the government takes away some of our freedoms uh, in exchange for protection. So whenever, you know, you're, you're having some of your, whatever, like your, some of these freedoms like taken away, like for instance, you can't just go and like, like kill somebody. You don't have the freedom to do that. So that's what I mean by that. Um, and the government is there, the criminal justice system is there to, to protect you from like, from getting murdered or whatever. Um, <laughs> in exchange for taking away your right to heal somebody. Uh, so whenever those rights are, are violated, I think that's something that I'm personally really um, passionate about because some of your rights are limited like anyways. And the more that you learn, like the law is what justifies what is right and wrong in this country. So for like, for instance, for a long time, you know, like interracial marriage was illegal. And then you had like um, the Supreme Court, um, it was Loving v. something. I don't remember what it was, but I do remember their last name was like Loving. And they went to the Supreme Court and they were like, you can't discriminate against, you know, interracial couples. That is now like a legal thing. So our law tell us what is right and what is wrong, but that doesn't mean we should necessarily never question the law either. I kind of went off on a little rant there. Um, so let me know if I'm not making any sense. Love you, West Virginia. Are you right? Virginia, <laughs> 1967. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a big one. Um, and then, you know, back in 2015, uh, even though gay, gay marriage wasn't necessarily illegal, it wasn't, um, it wasn't some people's rights to get married. And that's that's another like, that's another law thing. These are things that like affect people. Um, so it's just interesting. And I mean, like I said, the cool thing about criminal justice club, like we talk about these issues, we talk about these topics and we have like an open forum. And I would say for, for my past experiences, everybody in our club is really open to having like in-depth conversation. And these are conversations we don't, we don't argue. I've never had like a, an argument with anybody in the club over topics that maybe we um, disagree on. So if you're like a biology major, uh, so, um, social work major, like any of these things, but you feel passionate about these subjects, I would suggest like joining our club because it does provide a safe environment to talk about a lot of social issues involving that. And if you don't, if you want to know more about like your personal rights and you don't know where um, to find that information, that's also something that we talk about and discuss and can like give information to. Um, and this is really important. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to step off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have any questions? Or anybody on, on this call have any questions? For our criminal justice loves? <laughs> it's, it really, it, it really, it really is fun. Like it's a, it's a really fun club, like to be a part of. Um, it, you learn you learn a lot and um even if you need just like some electives outside of like your own major and you want to like know more we can recommend some courses uh, elective courses to take in, in the criminal justice field that might seem interesting some elective courses for other majors is that what you mean mm -hmm. cool because there's a lot of like little things that you never would have like thought of 
uh, you know, like um, like criminal theory. Once you learn about like criminal theory, you will never look at the world the same again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Honestly, and um, like I took a criminal um, what was it called? It was like criminal justice and moving images, and I got to learn about how the media actually affected like laws that were put in place especially like drug laws and racist laws um mm -hmm. so it shows like the impact of media even like way before now i'm talking like back when like newspaper for newspapers first started even back then with like newspaper and like journal media like that sort of thing also affected the laws and the views of how people were treated in this country so that was really interesting if you're interested in like media stuff and that's something like a film major might be interested in taking, you know, as an elective, just so that they can see the other side of it. So it like, yeah. it, and it goes across, across spectrums. So. I had a lot of, um, there's a lot of liberal arts majors mm -hmm. um, in that class too. Mm -hmm. and, and they seemed to really like it. And it was with Dr. Greenwood. Dr. Greenwood is an amazing professor. So she's definitely one of my favorite criminal justice professors. Yeah. Person so all the time. Advisor. I'm sorry. Hmm? Oh, nothing. I was going to say, like, all the time, Kirsten, like, apologizes for going on these rants, but every time I learn something, so, like, I don't see the issue. Anyways. <laughs> I saw something this morning that kind of made me smile. Um, it, because it was related to, Carla, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday about drug laws and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. that was originally started as a race target. And now it's like it's such an antiquated practice that has killed more people than the actual drugs. But I saw one this morning talking about how the IRS was started as the same thing and that taxation was kind of focused on minorities. So the tagline was, all right, let's cancel the IRS next. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah. it's, it, really, it really is like so interesting. You know, a lot of our, all our history comes from that. And it's funny because I actually wrote my very first year of, uh, of college. I actually wrote a paper over uh, like the legalization of marijuana and I read a lot of like like research articles and um, like scholarly journals over the fact that a lot of police stations back when I when I did this back in 2017 and these studies were done they felt as if um, a lot of the time was like wasted a lot of their like resources were wasted going after like marijuana like drug crimes um, because it really it, they just basically said um, it was a waste of like time and resources and they could be looking at a lot of like the harder drugs and putting those resources towards like domestic violence and gun violence. Um, and it was like a general survey over that. And that was something that I never really learned about until I got into into college. I could go on the on a rant about the drug laws all day long uh, <laughs> because they very are like racially driven um yeah so <laughs> kind of a, there's a yeah. uh i saw something today that put, it put like all these issues in one picture um and it was a guy on i'm gonna see if i can find i'll send it to you um and i've seen several versions of it but there was a guy on a tractor out in the field holding up an ar and it said uh my political views are that I just want uh, gay married thruples to guard their marijuana crops with <laughs> ARs and be happy. <laughs> that's awesome. Honestly, <laughs> that's, that's funny. That's good. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you get into the, the thoughts of like, um, so like private prisons, for example, this is a more like uh, political thing, but uh, the more research I've done on, on private prisons, uh, it's it's pretty crazy. And there have been a lot of like judges and elected officials who have gotten in trouble because, um, for instance, there is this, uh, this case, a judge is funneling um, juveniles to this certain detention center and he was getting a payday. So was juveniles who weren't necessarily like, like very like minor charges were getting sent to juvenile detention, which affects the course of their life for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm because they're surrounding them with, um, I don't wanna say any kid is like a bad kid, but you know, uh, mm -hmm. putting them in that sort of environment where they can uh, be affiliated with more like gang relation, more violence, um, you know, 
it's a lot of it, it creates like this mom mentality and these juveniles who have never been exposed to that in the first place that they weren't being sent there um so that judge is actually like caught got his got revoked and i'm not exactly sure what charges he got but this, this is actually pretty common it happens quite a bit when it comes to private prisons and private um juvenile facilities um and usually people who are who work in private prisons don't have a lot of training and uh they have really bad conditions um that's where riots start out the prison fires start um all of that it these are things that you know people will say oh like these things are never going to change things are the way they are and they're just going to be that way forever and uh, i always say to them i'm like it only takes one person to talk to another person to talk to another person and um that's what i i really do love about this club too is that it's a bunch of like-minded people and even like i'm like-minded some people don't don't mm -hmm. necessarily shame uh share the same views that that i do and that's okay but we gather together to really discuss these issues discuss these topics because they're all going to affect us in the future they affect our um the way that we vote the way they're going to live for the rest of our lives and the way that we vote affects um our um our student loan interests they affect taxes they affect you know all of these things it's like a it's like a domino effect that people don't realize that's all interconnected with everything so hmm. yeah. look at you <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no, I love the fact that you're so passionate about it because she's so the, eloquent. Yeah, you're in the field that you you know you can better learn and explore and and allows you to educate yourself and you bring that education forward. So, um, Garrett, who is the advisor for the Criminal Justice Club? Tammy Bracewell. Bracewell. Okay. Yeah, I have her right now. She's uh, my life and ethics professor. So I should have invited her. I feel bad. Oh, it really yeah. surprises me that she's doing. Uh, are you sure? Is it criminal justice and ethics? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what you said. You said race and ethics. Sounds like race and ethnicity. No, no, no. Uh, the color of the, ooh, I just ran over my cat. The color of justice. Um, race ethics in the uh, criminal justice system. So. Oh, okay. I bet that's interesting. I haven't taken that. Yeah, she does like these podcasts. Um, we, you know, because everything's online right now. And she just goes in depth and, you know, especially with what's been going on lately, she just gives you that insight. And it's always, what, what I find really cool about her is that she presents it to you non as non-biased as she can, you know? And mm -hmm. it, it, it really allows that conversation to be started. Um, one of the classmates that I have, he, you know, he's, he's very opposite views than myself. I consider myself progressive, maybe more liberal than most. Um, and he's kind of, you know, conservative and all that, but we have these conversations and we're able to explore and learn from each other. Um, what, you know, what, because, you know, backgrounds and life experiences make you have your own experience, it makes you have your own like ideology and everything. And she really encourages that. So uh, I think that's the one thing I love most about this particular field that like in sociology, it's always conflict. And <laughs> but you just you study it and there's really not a lot you can do with criminology or criminal justice you see how the system itself <laughs> conservative liberal <laughs> it's an oxymoron right <laughs> pretty much so um yeah it's good. the ones that get elected so, are just morons <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah don't no oxy to it <laughs> Well, you guys know me. Yeah. I'm a socialist with a capitalist pocketbook. I've always said it. <laughs> it's going to be my motto for the rest of my life. My heart is one thing, but I like driving that nice car. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a, it, the thing with criminal justice is like that something that I really learned is like where the trouble starts is people who go into criminal justice related fields and they don't have a heart for people. That's mm -hmm. where the issues arise because criminal justice is nothing but you should have empathy for other people in this subject because you're working with other people from different backgrounds, different educations. Um, so if you come into 
this major, especially with a closed mind, you're not going to learn anything at all. Yeah, it's like Krishan said. Yeah. And then like, I feel like it's not as much about necessarily being like-minded, it's more about being open-minded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely and it's it important is- to have empathy. Empathy is, is, is huge. And people, a lot of people like um, confuse empathy with a lot of like other emotions, but empathy is really just taking a step back and putting away your own personal biases and understanding, developing an understanding, even if you don't agree with something, developing an understanding of others. Um, so it's not to be, be confused with consent, but with sympathy it's not to be confused with conformity um people think just because you empathize with somebody that means that all of a sudden like you're conforming to their beliefs and that's not that's not it um so you people close themselves off because of that especially um like right now with everything going on because everything going on right now is very criminal justice related it's it's literally about the police system and how uh people of color remain treated in the system and i've met people who are like uh institutionalized racism doesn't exist and i <laughs> i'm like well it does uh um and i try to like explain to them but they close themselves off so fast they believe that it's it's um it doesn't exist it's it's um their way or the highway and people when it comes to like that sort of mindset People, and it is my personal belief that people like that shouldn't be a part of the criminal justice system because it does nothing but lead to um, an infringement of freedom because you can't step outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. Just because they want to uphold the status quo and not make any improvements whatsoever. And the biggest thing too that I have learned is that, especially with our, like, our, um, you know, the Bill of Rights, our first through 10 amendment rights that um, are the biggest thing to like the American people. Um, with those rights, those rights are there for a reason. They are for every American. They are, we are to uphold those rights, no matter what our biases are. And a lot of people like to pick and choose what rights they feel. Mm-hmm you know, that, that feel necessary and that's inaccurate. You don't get to pick which rights are right and what's wrong out of the amendments for you or other people. I can go in depth with that if you guys want me to, but it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I, y'all, this was, it's made me laugh. There was somebody from Europe the other day that tweeted, uh, it was going around, they were talking about the Third Amendment because of the Quartering Act and stuff that was going on with the National Guard and the hotels. And uh, somebody from Europe was like, wait, you'll have a Third Amendment? I thought you only had two. (laughs) (laughs) Surprise, we got 10. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amen. That's good. That was good, Garrett. I didn't come up with it. I just laughed at it. was not as close because let's see what did did say she said a lot of that desire to uphold the status quo is because they believe that changing the status quo will automatically mean their home life is threatened actions out of fear tend to overcome logic wow kineta with the knowledge and the wisdom i know like she's on her soapbox right now kineta i want to add to that i would say like more so the people who could change it the most easily are the people that write it and create it. Um, and they're not afraid of their home life going away. They're afraid of their power going away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they feed it, they feed into these little networks that convince voters that their home life is in danger. I think there are a lot of people who do the wrong thing with the right intent. They're just brainwashed. And I'm not justifying yeah. it. I'm just saying, I think there's a lot of people that are tricked into doing what they think is right. Which is why conversation and open-mindedness is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we have to have those conversations, you know? And we, yeah. have to, we have to be, we have to allow ourselves to, to be uncomfortable. Because they are uncomfortable conversations you're going to have. But at the same time, when you have those feelings, it's because there's something within you that's there. And then hopefully yeah. Yeah, that brings forth some sort of change. Which and then the vast majority of the people 
like that we know have like this like ingrained into their lives like it directly affects them yeah i don't think that we can sit back and not uh i kind of i want to i want to throw this out there because this reminds me so much of my my hometown right now so um if you guys didn't know my hometown is a sunset town i don't know if you guys know what that is yeah um so a sunset town um and i'm going to throw out there um right now this might be a a, a trigger warning for people of like racism so i'm going to go ahead and put that trigger warning out there right now so if you don't feel comfortable with this topic or you feel anxious i would recommend like leaving this conversation um <laughs> <laughs> i just mean like i it's a it's it, it can be triggering so i just wanted to make sure that everybody's ready for this conversation um so we used to have a billboard when there's actually a, a very small town outside of Bowie called Sunset. It's called Sunset because we had a billboard that said, don't let the sun set on your black foot of a, and you had to be in the town of Sunset or beyond by nightfall or you would be um, prosecuted in Bowie, Texas. And we actually have a, a road that is still there, that is still actively there called Hanging Tree Road. And there's a petition right now to get that, that change, that road changed. And the majority of the people in my town are very against getting that name changed. It, it's a big conversation and a lot of them, are, I have lived in Bowie, Texas all my life, like literally since birth. And I was always taught growing up that that was where um, people of color were, were lynched. Um, down there at that road, at this, at this tree, at the very end of that, uh, end of that road. So um, whenever people were like, we need to get this name change or everything that's going on, like having a hanging tree road, like it's not okay. And my family was actually so against it growing up. My cousin used to steal a sign a lot and um, hide it in our, um, we had like this huge like junk hole. So like, I think my cousin saw that sign like three or four times to get it down. But anyways, <laughs> I'm not gonna say his name because I don't want him to get any in trouble if it's any kids out. <laughs> but um, so a lot of people are coming back and saying, oh, it's because of the trees that that hang over hang over the road. It has nothing to do with with lynching people. And somebody trying to say there's no like records of anybody being being lynched there. But I'm like, do you not realize that back then um, people of color were treated as two thirds of a person that mm -hmm. it had nothing. It was, it's not historically there because they didn't think that they were people. Why would they set aside the time to write down the men and women that they hung and prosecuted unjustly? I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but right now I have actually been talking with, um, a friend of, that I went to high school with, I went down there this past weekend and I was like, we've got to know, and I actually signed this petition. Um, I've shared it on my Facebook um, and, my, and my Twitter, if you guys wanna go and sign this uh, petition because we're trying to get that, that um, road changed, the name changed. Um, yeah, so there's the end of, end of that story, but those are just things that a lack of, lack of empathy, being blinded, being, stuck in your ways like those are the things that keep people stuck and those are the things that infringe upon the rights of every american's freedom like you cannot pick and choose if you're as american as you say you know you cannot pick and choose who deserves the rights because of their skin color it's unjust it violates their freedom and if you believe that america is the great country that that it is then you need to be pushing for those people to have the same rights as you do and not be so blind about it yeah it's liberty and justice for all. Have you ever been to Heiko, Texas? Mm -mm. It's not too far. It's probably about an hour or so from here. And they had that the sign you were talking about. It said the same thing, but it had another mm -hmm. word instead of black. And they actually have a place there called the Coffee Cup Family Restaurant. And back in the day, it was called the Coffee Cup Cafe. And it was not spelled with C's. Um, and it is now the, and that it was the actual clan meeting house, supposedly. I have no way to confirm that, don't care to. But um, back when I was working political campaigns, that was always the halfway point between anywhere we were going. 
So we actually, it's now the Coffee Cup Family Restaurant because somebody finally bought it out from them, but they still spell it with K's. And I mean, we went in there, people like, it was like, there was no weird vibe when we went in. And yes, the breakfast food was like, but it's like, okay, <laughs> it's such a weird thing that that was still, cause we, in our minds, we were kind of like, oh, okay, well, that was a long time ago, no big deal. But I worked an event near there and uh, I was taking my volunteer list back to my campaign and somebody stopped me outside and said, hey, dude, that guy you were talking to in there, maybe don't put him in charge of your volunteers. We're like, why? And I was like, rumor has it he's in the clan. I was like, that was one of the nicest people I've ever talked to. Like, oh, what the wow. heck? And later I asked for clarification. I was like, why? You know, what gives you them? Basically, they were helping him move some stuff out of an old property he owned, and some box came open, and one of the knives that came out of this box had, like, a clan insignia, but I was like, were they his knives, or were those, like, really old that came with the house? Like, oh, we're not sure. I was like, maybe ask him before telling everyone he's in the clan, <laughs> but yeah. all that to say, it's like, there's, it's, it's, it's kind of like the buoy thing. I have to, here's one question I have, and this is not a thing I'm advocating for, this is just a curiosity point what like how do you feel about if let's say even if they kept the if they changed the name of the road but had like a in like a little historical thing there to say this happened like that way it's not i don't think renaming it is erasing history but at the same time i don't want i wouldn't want someone to drive through and be like oh everything was always great here you know like at the because then nobody learns from it yeah like, what, what i mean I would, I, I would be um I would be for that, you know, like having some sort of like, uh, like clarification of what, you know, like what that area like means, but it's the fact that people are denying that it ever happened in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because That's my issue. family has lived, my family has lived in Bowie for at least, at least like six or seven, like full generations. So we, we've been there a very long time and my nanny is very old. She's like in her, in her eighties, um, you know, and growing up as a small girl, she remembers people being lynched out there. So she understands like what that road means, but it's everybody, it's the fact that everybody in the town who doesn't want the name changed, it's not like they're, um, you know, the, they just deny that it ever happened. And that that's the problem that we're facing. So, yeah. you know, how can I would learning from history is, is very important, but you have to admit that it happened before you can even learn from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What Garrett like said, that's the same thing for Vidor, Texas. Yeah. For what, Texas? Vidor, V I D O R. I might need to know these names, places there. I will not drive by. <laughs> I'll take the long way around. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're a person of color, don't stop there. You ride through there with your windows up in a full tank of gas and all the way through after dark, or just avoid it all together. If you, if you are not another community, like driving through certain areas of LA, if you're not black or Hispanic, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mom one time like i think this was before i was born but she was driving through texas and i think like a little like a little town outside of like houston or something she actually saw like a kkk parade oh. i don't know she told me about it i was like Ugh. and i'm glad um, we're having all these conversations and i'm glad we're having um you know the protests and all that because it's bringing it's something that for so long people are like oh racism doesn't exist in america anymore or, you know, bigotry is not there anymore, and it does, and, and it needs to come out, and it needs to be handled and talked about, and folks like you are going to make those differences. So. Yeah, and go, like going back home, like going back to my hometown for even like four days, and because my family owns a fireworks stand there, um, there are even, there are even racist fireworks, <laughs> you know, like. How do you um, do that? There are these fireworks, they're called whistle chasers now, but they were called inward chasers mm. back wow. in the back in the day. Um, so people at the same literally come up to me, instead of calling them chasers, they would ask me, can I get four chasers? And um, 
<laughs> I had to, my uncle asked me to actually leave the stand and I actually called my uncle racist um, over the over the weekend, but that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it's it's just little things like, like that. And when I have conversations with my family, because I have half my family understands and half my family like doesn't, they're just, cons they're closed-minded conservatives and that's just what they are. Like they're, they're closed-minded and that's where they mess up. That's where the problem is, is the closed-mindedness. Um, yeah, and whenever I would have these conversations with them, like I would be like, listen, like I've read studies, I wrote papers, I'm putting money into an education like to know more about this. And they're like, well, I may not be as smart as you, but this is what I believe. And that's that's when you know, like, you really can't get anywhere with that. And they think they're like, oh, you're just one person. What can you do? Like, it's been this way for hundreds of years. You're not going to change anything. And I'm like, it's because I as an individual may not change anything doesn't mean that I in a group of people can't. Um, exactly. And I'm like, and that's a really dumb way to think about movements, right? I'm like, do you not realize that? when Amer when um our founding fathers like broke away from from britain and started the revolution like they were just a group of people who they were a ragtag bunch of nobodies they didn't have any money the majority of them didn't like you know and they started this thing like by them by themselves you know they didn't have this huge driving force france really helped out until later like so thinking about just being happy with the way that things are and saying, well, that's the way that they are because that's how they are for hundreds of years. We wouldn't have the country that we have. So people who like have that mindset, I just, I, I've never really understood it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I've, as I've learned more and more from higher education, from being a criminal justice major, that's when it, it really allows me to to branch out and make these connections and talk about it in the way that that I do, and that's where my passion comes from. Yeah, you can't make a change until you try. Exactly, it, and even if I fail, like I can say that at least I tried. You know what I mean? Even if I just change like one person's mind, if I make one person like open up to certain ideas, one little change, like to me that makes all the difference because if we just, if all we ever did was settle, we wouldn't be where we are today. Amen. Yep. That's just, I can't add to that. <laughs> That's that. <laughs> Everybody okay? Quick post check. Well, Mr. Williams, you doing all right? Miss Amanda, you doing good? Savannah? Okay. Gary? Um. <laughs> yeah that was, that was real heavy sorry guys but okay. I just I had to I had to get it out there because it's yeah. it's criminal justice it's what these are the conversations we have in our club mm -hmm. um these are the matters that are, are important so people who want to be a part of these conversations um yeah. or even just want to know more outside of themselves like that is what we're here for thank you thank you for sharing that and this is kind of bleeding into what uh, next week. Um, next week we're going to have Garrett and SGA to kind of talk to us about the importance of voting. You know, so that's just going to be a continuation of this conversation of, of what what we started. And that's what I think that's what orgs do within higher ed. You know, they they bring like-minded folks, have forums for them to express themselves in a safe environment. So. Yeah, I'm going to come in and tell everybody why they're wrong and who they should vote for. It's going to be real productive. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to make yeah, that yeah, like, Vote for Kanye. <laughs> Mr. Smith, everybody you've been all invited. <laughs> God, Hannah, you're not even going to get me started on <laughs> Kanye. Good <laughs> Lord. Oh. Is that who you are? Tweeted, uh, the Libertarian Party of Texas tweeted to him yesterday and goes, hey, do you know how ballot access laws work? <laughs> <laughs> Reality check. Um, First, he said he was running last time, and I think the time before that, he ain't gonna do it. Uh, uh, I, uh, it's an advertisement to his new album that's coming out. That's yeah, just like it's yeah. hype. It's that's all it is. I hope. Y'all remember well, when? Is, that's it. Huh? Remember when uh, every like 
not everyone, obviously, but a, a lot of people were saying how, I forget what which election it was, but they were saying to write Robin Williams' name in it. Yeah, and people were doing that for Harambe, too. Uh, it tried Virginia or North Carolina, I forgot which state it was, where D's Nuts was the write-in, <laughs> and it was polling higher than Hillary and Trump. <laughs> Actually? It was early on, but that write-in was polling higher than the two of them. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't think that's the D's Nuts guy. The guy that's that is... in the next uh, coffee, but a, a system where it's like, what if instead of a president, we had a, a council of three where the Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian nominee all ran the show together? You'd have like a balanced veto over all three. And I was like, I've heard worse ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, I feel like this one's good. I can't wait to see you guys next week can get deeper into this because I love my soapbox. You know what? Maybe as a craft, I really might make a box for me to stand on. <laughs> Please do. That would uh, that would be a beautiful image. We could make it. I'll take a picture. We could make it the cover of the podcast. The soapbox. Oh, we are gonna have a podcast, Garrett. The Blue Codes are gonna start their podcast. So I dig it. Yeah. Oh, I also have a fact sheet about Susan Burton, but we can save it because I know we're running out of time. Oh, I'm so sorry, Hannah. I no, completely did. Like, I mean, like the conversation was going in a huh? You could touch on it. We have some time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Well, the conversation we were having was really important. There's no way I'd want to interrupt that. But this is a highlight on Susan Burton. She's a criminal justice activist. I have to read off this because I can't memorize all of it. <laughs> um, she's a black criminal justice activist. Um, it all started when her five-year-old son was accidentally hit and killed by a police cruiser in 1982. Mm. I know. And then. Um, it got into this cycle because, you know, obviously she was distraught. She became addicted to crack, co crack cocaine, and then she got into the prison cycle. She was in and out of prison like six times, and before she could finally find like rehabilitation that she could afford. And then, you know, every time she was released, she didn't have any money. She didn't have an ID. She didn't have a social security card. And all the time she'd get caught and like put back in prison, they just get, they just struggle with re-entry. And um, minority and like um, poorer like uh, communities are definitely disproportionately targeted by drug addiction and things like that. And it's not like their fault or anything. It's just systematic. Um, but yeah, so she, recovered at this rehabilitation center. She decided, hey, I wanna make a change. She bought this uh, house, I think in LA, in 1998, and she used it to support recently released female offenders. Um, and mm, that was in 1998. And then for about like 10, 12 years, the funding was getting really difficult because she was supporting everyone and then it was getting really difficult. But um, her friend helped her get this grant to turn it into a real nonprofit. Um, so she founded the nonprofit called A New Way of Life in 2000, which is a year before I was born. So this isn't that long ago at all. Um, that helps formerly incarcerated people fighting problems with reentry into the prison system. Um, now she's a certified chemical dependency counselor. She has five transitional houses in LA. She helps women rejoin society, find work, recover from drug addiction. Um, they also run a free legal clinic uh, and each woman gets her own caseworker. And she's already helped over a thousand women struggling with reentry into the prison system. And they also provide over $2 million in donated goods every year. Wow. Um, so they've helped over 3,000 homeless people um, find a home and like live a good life. And they provide pro bono work to over 2,000 uh, previously incarcerated people. So One yeah, I don't know. You have a difference. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how to stick it to them. Mm -hmm. 
he was stuck in that cycle and so many people could have said oh that's never going to change she's been in and out of jail six times she's stuck no <laughs> Yeah, there, there was recidivism right in, in America, like prison systems. Um, and this is just a statistic. But last time I checked, it was at 86%. Yeah. And it's because, like you said, um, honestly, <laughs> I want to say our country hates prisoners, but they don't exactly give them the best resources, especially like men who go into the prison system uh, who have children. A lot of them go into debt because of uh, of child support. I'm not saying they shouldn't pay child support, but they have no way of paying it because they can't get a job once they get out. And then they go back to like the drugs because they need to support their kids and like family members and like stuff like that. It's, uh, like you said, it really impacts like people of color being people of color um, disproportionately with, uh, with white people. So yeah, that was really yeah. good, Hannah. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> well, we just talked about the changes that need to be made, you know. Well, that was a positive note because one person made that big of a difference for so many folks. So, exactly. and that's also kind of a moral for y'all. You know, you think you're just the one voice making, like Kristen said, oh, I'm just the one voice in Bowie. No, that one voice can make a big difference. So each one of you is tasked with that. It's It's a big responsibility, but you know what? You guys can do it. I mean, y'all intelligent, leaders. So I have a hundred. Like I'm the voice for the privileged white straight male on all these talks. So <laughs> I will throw in my two cents: legalize all the happy chemicals now and release all the nonviolent offenders. <laughs> and and B because it's such a waste of our resources. Like why would I? Don't it know. is. I will say this as the guy who's normally like legalize and privatize everything. Don't privatize prisons. That's my two cents. Oh yeah. I mean, get it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> if they would elect me as president, people may hate me half the time, but it's only half the time. Not only that. you were gonna say something? I was gonna say like with the uh, with the prison, you can actually buy stocks. You can buy stocks for those uh, for those prisons too. I was looking at the. Uh, the civic corpse and theirs is like at like nine nine dollars and seventy six cents. So, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you can oh, like incentivize arrests, basically. Oh my God! What? Yeah. Why? It's like and there's that whole thing with prison labor and like oh my God, they make like what a dollar a day? Less huh? than that. Prison labor, slave labor. It is. See, that's where it that's where it branches into. It's not even capitalism anymore. It's cronyism, and it ain't good. All right. Well, <laughs> that got dark. <laughs> it's, just, it's just true. I can't wait to see how many people watch this. This is gonna be awesome. <laughs> see, I forget I'm being recorded. One of these days, I'm gonna get an email. It's like, sir, um, <laughs> you said this at the 15 minute mark. <laughs> No, it's just going to say, we're supporting your campaign. So when do you start? <laughs> I hate campaigning. Yeah, let's <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, anybody you. that's on this call wants to say anything? Miss Jackie, do you do you want to? Do you have any announcements from the bookstore? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> right. No, uh, no announcements for the bookstore. We're still here. We're still getting orders. We're doing the best we can. So, yeah, send send people my way. Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, I have uh, students that are contacting different um, advisors and teachers and stuff, saying, "Hey, can you find out from the bookstore if?" And I'm like, "I'm right here, y'all. Call. <laughs> I'm still here. Call me. Email me. So if you hear anything from students, send them my way." Okay. Um, are you going to be so, back on campus um, soon, or is it all virtual? Oh, no, we've been open uh, for a couple of months now. Uh, awesome. The doors, yeah, the doors are essentially open. It's just blocked off. You can only kind of walk around. Um, and yeah, we're we're here. The doors are open from about 8 to 12 or 8 to 1 a day. Um, if I'm here, I've got one propped open so people can call in and, you know, talk to me. It's easier to help right then and there. So send them my way. Okay. And I'm loving, I'm loving the dialogue. I love listening to you guys. It's a uh, it's a breath of fresh air. It's enjoyable. <laughs> you know, oh, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> you can make make someone laugh, make someone cry. It's all good. 
Hey, all in one, right? <laughs> Sour Patch Kids. Full service. Yeah. <laughs> <Sweet and> sour. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kanetta. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Jackie, and everybody else that joined today. And of course, you blue coats are awesome. Um, thank you for the hard conversations, but you know, you guys are willing to have these. So hopefully we have some folks join the club, which is what we're trying to drive. <laughs> And as always, I, I love you. Bye. I love y'all so much. And I will talk to you later. Have a good bye. day. Take care. Thank bye. you. Bye. Well, bye. <laughs>